All right. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday night. Welcome. This is the Pandemic Proof Singer Series. I'm Danielle Tucker. I'm a singer, vocal coach. I'm a lead singer for the Mighty Untouchables Band. And I'm also the creator of a brand new digital course called I'm With The Band. It's a it's a fun digital course for um, pro-minded singers. Um, so if you're kind of wondering how to advance your career in such a time as this, in an unprecedented worldwide crisis, you're in the right place tonight because my guest and I were here to spread encouragement and not germs. So away we go. Let me introduce my wonderful guest tonight. This is Allison Adams Tucker. She is from San Diego, California, singer, songwriter, session artist. She's a wonderful multilingual jazz vocalist. Um, Allison, you have a love for languages and world cultures. Um, you've, you've lived abroad, you've traveled, toured abroad. Um, you've traveled to over 15 countries um, and that has heavily influenced your music. Um, your debut album, Come With Me, from 2008, uh, which was co-produced by Peter Sprague and arranged by Kamau Kenyatta. You were nominated for Best Jazz Album for that by the San Diego Music Awards. Um, and that album also spurred a hit song, which kind of garnered you a cult following uh, <laughs> for your uh, interpretation of La Vie en Rose um, because of the video game, The Saboteur, right? <laughs> That was really wild, yeah. And how many years later, 12 years later, 11 years later, it's still creating a buzz in all of the digital streaming platforms and iTunes. Oh my gosh, it's amazing how that wow. happens. I yeah. And then your next album, um, April in Paris, was recorded in Paris. And um, your third album, Wanderlust, Wanderlust, sorry, was given four stars by Downbeat Magazine. Um, that was recorded in New York City um, with producer Matt Pearson. And your fourth yet-to-be-released album called Retro Trilogy um, was recorded also in New York City. And that was uh, kind of a revisit to your pop-punk past. It's a trilogy of jazz reimaginings of what you call three decades of music, 1970s, 80s, and 90s, um, including an original song. So I would love to start there because I got um, to listen to some of the album yesterday and it's incredible. So I'd love to hear about it. Oh, thank you, Danielle. And first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join you here on this really cool hang on Facebook. And hello, everyone that's uh, sitting in to uh, join us as well. What crazy times we're in. Uh, retro, yeah, it's uh, actually a very appropriate um, place to rest your, your mind on at times like this. We have a lot of time to contemplate and to retrospect. And uh, as I think back on the way that things were pre-pandemic, uh, it causes me to think about uh, what are the most important things in my life that I want to move forward with? What are the things I'd like to change and adjust? And where did I come from? How did I end up in this state of affairs or, you know, the habits that I'm in or the skill sets that I'm using most readily on a daily basis now? And Retro Trilogy did that for me as well, the whole planning process. So um, as I was choosing music you know I did my first album come with me was debut album so I just wanted to kind of get out into the jazz world with standards and some world classics you know uh, we had some Japanese music and French and Spanish um, Brazilian music on that album but pretty standard familiar music my second one was at the end of a, a Europe tour and it was very European in flavor felt very European after nine concerts in Italy with you know mm -hmm. a band, same band. And we ended up in uh, Paris on International Jazz Day, the first um, Herbie Hancock's first annual International Jazz Day. So that uh, album felt and all of the songs that I chose for it, springtime songs, were very European in nature and feeling. Uh, and the, the uh, third album, Wanderlust, was really taking the whole 
multicultural thing to a new level. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to record and release all 12 tracks in the six languages that I normally sing in. Mm -hmm. And we did record many of them in all six languages, but uh, we didn't end up getting distributors in those different countries to release all of those. So we just released the one album. So this was the first time that I was not really clinging to the multicultural global concept. Mm -hmm. And I was more really just slowing down and taking a look behind me at what I'd done thus far with, you know, more than a decade of, of hard work and touring and musical contemplation, I decided to pay homage to my beginnings, you know, where did my music uh, start? And so 70s, I was very young, but it's real. I mean, I've been singing since, honestly, since uh, before I could speak. I know that's a cliche, but literally singing since before I could speak and raised in a very musical family. Uh, So music from the 70s is something very specific to the music my family played. Mm -hmm. Uh, Being the oldest child, I didn't have older brothers and sisters giving me their influences musically. And then in the 80s, you know, I was coming and I was, that was my, my early adult, my adolescent years. That was when I started singing in bands uh, professionally. And uh, I was definitely a punker, although, you know, you use the word punker and the, those who are in the punk scene have all these different labels. So, uh, yeah. But uh, I was, I sang cover music and, uh, and, and punk and expressed myself with kind of a rebellious attitude for <laughs> well over a decade. And then the 90s was you know, kind of going into a more moderated lifestyle, finding harmony and happiness and good health. <laughs> the 80s weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a really powerful and healing uh, experience to go through each of those um, decades and choose eight tracks. Mm-hmm. eight songs from each of those decades that were not jazz. Yeah. And think about what the treatment could be of them. Do the were the lyrics and the melodies and maybe the chord progressions or the or at least the the overall form of the songs were they solid enough? Was there enough substance there that we could really take them and do something powerful with them or interesting with them? Mm-hmm. Um and not the case with a lot of music from any decade you know but we can right. fingers at one decade or another and say oh the music in that decade was but uh yeah so really healing and here we are now with you know the whole music industry at a standstill as we knew it but we already were kind of at this big turning point in the music industry right before all of this hit with the DSPs, the digital streaming platforms, taking precedence over even downloads, let alone uh, labels and mm-hmm. the the classic uh, uh, album release uh, protocol. It's mm-hmm. the way of making money and mm-hmm. the way of keeping music flowing, high quality music flowing in the world today, mm-hmm. uh, and we're still navigating that. And I can see that we have really accelerated that process Mm -hmm. during these last four or five months as a result of people being forced to jump on the streaming train. Yeah. And hold the reins because you better jump on the streaming train. (laughs) Better (laughs) For a variety of reasons. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I love the concept of the album. It's it's amazing and it seems like, um, you know, this is a it's it's a jazz album that is going to reach a even a broader audience because of you know the cover aspects you know reaching into different genres and um, you know I think uh, I think it's going to be a big hit in that arena and I'm curious to know um, since we are in this quarantine situation and we are dependent on our online technology what's your game plan for the release. And thank you for mentioning, you know, reaching a wider market. That was one of my goals. Uh, I was feeling very limited by the jazz title, and I don't see myself as just a jazz singer. I never have been. Um, I'm a singer, 
and mm -hmm. I want to reach anyone that uh, is interested in my message. I just like the freedom of interpreting a melody in whatever way I see fit, as well as all my musicians. And I love the level of professionalism and um, musicianship with people who are, are educated in the whole jazz language. Yeah. Uh, as far as a game plan, uh, the, the concepts that I was brainstorming with my producer, Matt Pearson, uh, as we were discussing this trilogy concept, which was his idea, uh, was to start a rollout concept like what he's been doing with um, Sony Music and Warner Brothers recently. Uh, they, and it's what pop music has been doing. Jazz hasn't really jumped on board with mm -hmm. it as quickly, but I think everyone is now that we have to. Yeah. But uh, you release a single onto all the streaming platforms, get a buzz going, maybe release another and, and kind of feed it into the, the machine, you know, a couple months apart until and, and get people uh, excited about the album and then release the album mm -hmm. um, digitally along with a, a hard release and touring which we don't have to worry about right now I'm looking at it from that angle there's a lot of energy uh, that goes into tour booking and promoting and and as oh, an independent thanks. artist I mean that's just it's much, much more work um, for a release. So I'm seeing this as a blessing in that I don't have to think as much about the touring at this time and I can put more of my energy and my money uh, into uh, releasing it digitally uh, to gain more exposure, to reach, you know, what good is the music if people aren't gonna hear it? So to reach as many people as I can. So, um, 70s 80s and 90s music eight songs each uh each ep i'll release one mm -hmm. from the 70s uh i haven't decided if i'm going to do one from the 70s then one from the 80s one then one from the 90s yeah. or if i'll do 70s and release the 70s ep 80s in in chronological order i haven't decided that yet mm -hmm. but uh release them across all the streaming platforms and then it will end in like one CD, obviously you can't get um, 18, oh wait a minute, it's eight tracks. Or is it six tracks? It's six tracks each each EP. Okay. Uh, 18, because it's 18 total tracks. Um, 18 tracks on one at one CD, it's not possible, like you know, to actually get the old school CD in hand with all 18 tracks. Uh, so I'll be choosing, you know, uh, a limited number from each one to be on the CD and then the others will be a bonus. Okay. They can get digitally. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so many more options as far as yeah. what you can do digitally, uh, now than even five months ago with the way that, uh, Instagram and uh, the social media platforms are stepping up with music mm -hmm. and the way that YouTube has is offering music and Apple music and I mean, the list is very, very long. Yeah. What platform have you um, had the most success with so far? I, so for come with me, I did everything myself. I created my own label and publishing company and um, I did a, a radio campaign through an online company called Radio X Direct, and it was an international radio campaign, pretty cheap, and it, it reached public radio stations worldwide, and I gained, you know, ex uh, direct uh, connection with each of the DJs who were playing, who were requesting from me and playing my music, so then I have these relationships that I created mm -hmm. with DJs in all these different cities around the world, then when I was touring, I could meet them and I mean we became friends yeah. um, and I did my own publicity and reached started learning the whole um, journalism how to uh, method of getting reviews and you know what magazines are those that apply to my genre and 
getting to know the writers and and building a rapport with them so that when you get another album then they already know you and they like your stuff and they'll take a listen mm -hmm. and so the second album was easier that way the third album i hired a team to do it for me just to see how that could be done and to i was tired yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it was very enlightening um to see how it was done from you know a teamwork standpoint uh, but I'd say residually at this point, I made the most money from doing it myself on that first album yeah. um, to, to date. I'm still mm -hmm. making the most money from that first album. Um, and I did it all through a company called TuneCore as far as my, my digital distribution. Mm -hmm. And I used CD Baby for my hard, my hard copies, which they don't offer anymore, interestingly, yeah. like in the last year. But um, they've come a long way with being able to keep track of, uh, oh, and I will mention for the third album, when I hired the team, I also signed with a, a Seattle based label called origin records, fantastic label. Um, but again, I was not, I'm not part of any of the numbers for that album. So I don't know exactly how that album is doing. Okay. Um, but what I like about having released self released for the first two albums is that, I can go on and see exactly what songs are playing, how many streams, how many downloads, in what countries. And I can even connect with specific groups in, in specific countries. And they're constantly adding um, new platforms all over the world. And they give you an opportunity to get your music into those platforms and yeah. ringtones. And so that definitely has been um, the best decision and hard work that I did. Yeah, there really are. And, uh, you know, right now, it seems there are so many platforms, all of yeah. which are great opportunities. And it seems mm -hmm. like the temptation would be to just do it all, do all of them. Um, but, you know, I hear more and more things about, uh, you know, it's all about Spotify and getting on playlists right now. But then the next moment you hear it's about um, this or that. Uh, what What are your feelings about that? Do you think you're going to take a broad approach are there any areas that, uh, that you think you might really focus on excellent question um i do believe that you need to get your music in this uh this era that we are in i think you need to get your music everywhere where it's available because yeah. spotify you know you have hardcore spotify fans mm -hmm. and spotify is worldwide not not so much maybe in the Middle East and China and uh, African countries. There are some countries that have their own platforms mm -hmm. and I, I sign up for those for those countries. And you yeah. don't see a huge return if you don't have something that really causes a viral effect there. But but as far as worldwide Spotify, you've yeah, you've got to you've got to get into Spotify. You've got to be building your your fan base, your mm -hmm. followership on Spotify as well and be active with the listeners there. And that's the trickiest part. Um, it's so, um, there's, there's no way to really, even after all of the conferences that I've gone to and the, the panels that I've, uh, listened to with Spotify execs and, and, um, social media campaign company specialists, no one can really put their thumb on what it takes to get a viral response to followers on yeah. Spotify or how to cure getting into the pocket of curators for uh, the play, the playlists that are being uh, listened to by millions um, in the jazz world. You kind of know that if you're on one of the, the top two or three jazz labels, um, the relationships that have been forged already, yeah, they know the curators really well and they're going to have a really strong listen mm. to any new releases. So it's a bit harder for the indie. And it's definitely that way for the other genres. But it, but then again, though, there are these quirky releases that they are independent and they get on a major playlist and, and go viral. But I will say Pandora has been, and Pandora's United States only, mm -hmm. but I am forever grateful to Pandora. That's where I make the majority of my money. And I have the hugest following. Um, I hadn't looked at it for a really long time. I mean, like years. I hadn't looked at how many regular listeners I have. 
Um, and I finally, I went to Austin, Texas last year, this week, actually last year for CD Baby's DIY conference. Mm-hmm. Really spectacular. We're not going to be doing those for a little while, but yeah. um, I'm glad I went. And Spotify had their people there and Pandora had their, I mean, everyone had their people there. YouTube had their people there. Very, very helpful forums were going on. But I got to sit just like, you know, like you and me right now, sit with the the two people in uh, in charge of the Pandora um, acquisitions. Yeah. And they uh, set me up with their new artist uh, app connectivity program, for lack of a, a better term. And... I looked at my numbers for the first time in a long time, and I just recently looked again since then, so it's been a year. Mm-hmm. And I think I've had 65 million streams. Wow. In, That's incredible. In the 12 years that that, the, that first album has been out. And oh, I, average about, um, I average about 60,000, 70,000 a month. And I didn't do anything for that. Yeah. And it's not, and you would think that one DSP, one streaming platform would be indicative of your followership on others. Like Spotify, if you've got a million followers on Spotify, you probably have a higher, a high number on Pandora. Wow. It's not the case at all. My Spotify, you know, I make maybe 30 bucks a month off of, off of Spotify, but I literally have like 600 followers. It's, and I don't know how to get any traction in there. Certain yeah. songs will do well for a while. So uh, will I, yes, I will be definitely sending out to Spotify now that it's going to be a, a, a wider net, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. with not just being the jazz community, but I'll be, be reaching a wider scope i will be reaching out to curators that um are in larger genres of playlists Mm -hmm. in both pandora and spotify and i will definitely send to all of the others Mm -hmm. um there's no harm in it actually i'd say the harm that you might have heard of uh with diluting your music what might be in a a different kind of streaming conversation when it comes to streaming concerts people Mm -hmm. have talked about you know build your presence on youtube but don't dilute it with trying to send to all of these others okay then you then you lose some of those youtube people to oh i'd rather listen to her on instagram or i'd Mm -hmm. rather listen to her um and i'm still kind of undecided on that but i have i understand that a bit more but when it comes out to you know, availability, people have Alexa, people have Echo, people have, people use Siri, people use Android, you need to be on all of the platforms and you need to know what your numbers are on all of them yeah. and be an active member in trying to engage your, your audience on each of those platforms. Mm-hmm. Wow. You make a Intense. great case for it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think, um, you're such a good model for a lot of new artists. And I love having this conversation with you because um, you can see that so much work goes into the promotion of an album. It's not just made and then dropped on CD Baby and then wait and see what happens. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of networking, reaching out. Um, It's a lot of reach out. Outreach is is the word. (laughs) A lot of connecting. Yeah. A lot. And if, and a lot of musicians, as this has been said a million times, are amazing artists and so creative, Mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily great managers of time Mm -hmm. or not great managers of money or not great managers of organizational skills needed to forge relationships with people that can make a difference, people that that can take your music further Mm -hmm. and that takes yeah it takes patience and diligence and discipline and when you feel like you've been all the doors have been closed on you it it takes saying i love music i'm not going to give up and open the door again and just keep pushing forward again and again in the name of music where do you think that business sensibility came from for you 
Were you in a different line of business before music or were you influenced by something else? You ask such wonderful questions, Danielle. I've had a lot of interviews and yeah. you, you, you get a feeling right away for uh, how invested the interviewer is in the topic. Well, thanks. Um, I'm asking for myself, really. <laughs> That's what well, it is. And, and you are a very savvy individual. You're a, a, a deep thinker as well. I, I appreciate oh, it about you. Um, were you... <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? It was really good. Oh my gosh. I asked where uh, where your business Thank sensibilities you. came from. Yeah. Thank you. Oh my <laughs> word. Uh, um, I have to go back a bit. Let's see. My first job, I will toot it. What the heck? Yeah, let's do it. Um, I was 15 and a half. I went to high school in Solana Beach, California, and I lived in Escondido, uh, both for those of you who aren't in San Diego, those are both San Diego County areas. And I worked at a Burger King nice. and I was the order taker at the window and I had great training. I think of all of the employment that I've had over the years and what I've learned from each of them. Um, I had great training on my first job at a fast food restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was a long time ago. Uh, we, we were uh, hammered with customer service and courtesy and, uh, and um, propriety and accuracy and um, time efficiency. Time mm -hmm. efficiency was huge. I don't think I'd really thought about, oh, and the word expedite. I'd know, I learned the word expedite as an order taker. Hmm. Yeah. That was a word that we used a lot, you know, expedite, expedite. And we came up with the fastest, smoothest, easiest way to do every function. Mm -hmm. And I kind of became a junkie. As soon as I learned that this was a concept, I, I started applying it to everything in my life from... Yeah the way that I get ready, the way I put on my makeup, the way that I uh, would walk from one point to another, or the way, you know, then when I became a driver, <laughs> 16, only six months later, the way that I would, you know, drive from point A to point B, or the, I mean, literally everything. So that was hugely helpful, mm -hmm. just learning how to organize. Um, and I was a business owner, I was a hairstylist for 10 years. Mm. And as a private contractor. I learned how to manage inventory and I was, I trained um, people. I learned how to work with people in a very symbiotic and harmonious way to get the best out of people so that you were a team and happy and thriving and feeling good about each other and yourself. And um, I learned how to build a clientele and how to manage my money. And um, that all came from, I'd say the hair business. Yeah. And then I became a teacher and I applied those things in my teaching. And this was a totally different skill set. And uh, then after traveling the world and teaching around, uh, I came back and my, my music, you know, when I started out in the bands and traveling on the road, I was really at the mercy of the leader of the band and I was literally the lead singer and I played keyboards and I let them do everything. I didn't learn anything about the process in those first few years. I was mm -hmm. kind of lost in a 1980s haze and I'll say drugs and alcohol had a little bit to do with that too, <laughs> but um, to be quite candid. But yeah. um, once I came full circle and worked, worked and lived abroad, came home, and then got a position at a community college in Oceanside called Miracosta College. Uh, I was a teacher, I became the academic director, and then I became the center director. And I ran that school for a number of years, hiring, doing personnel. I was the immigration officer. I did homestays, I, I, I did activities, uh, I, I did the curriculum. That's really where I learned like to a new level uh, how to network with people, how to create spreadsheets to organize 
uh, the flow of a day when you were going to have multiple things happening at one time, yeah. logistics and traveling, all of that. Yeah. I quit that job. I, I resigned from that job and I went right into music full time and I treated it like a business from the first day. And I'd say that there we have it, the, the yeah. snowball of, and I think I've, I've relaxed a bit since that corporate experience. Mm -hmm. um, I've become a little more loosey goosey, you know, more artistic, if you will, simply because I want to enjoy the whole process a little more. And I've yeah. found ways to simplify without over organizing. Yeah, that's a that's such a it's a beautiful story. And I always love it when I talk to somebody who can see the value that came from those experiences early on. You know, I, I think especially in our industry, um, because we're all artistic, you know, there is sometimes that mindset that if we're doing anything that falls outside the realm of creating the art, we're wasting our time or it's, a, you know, it's a waste of our time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can look back all the way to your service days, you know, working at a Burger King window and how much value you can extract from that now. And I think it's an important lesson for all of us, um, the whole music community right now, because we're all in a position right now wondering, well, what does the future hold for me in a performing capacity? And, um, you know, how am I going to move on from here? And I know there's a lot of people out there that are considering different avenues and, um, you different know, careers. Right. And, my response to that is, um, well, number one, don't do it under the mindset, oh, I, I'm, I got to give this up, you know, and think of it in negative terms. But just knowing that even if you do go down another avenue for a certain period of time, you're going to be able to draw something from that to carry it over into your artistic life. There's no no shame in that. You got to you got to keep 100%. a paycheck coming in the door one way or another and just, mm -hmm. um, you know, walk with it, knowing that um, it's just part of your journey, you know, and you you you'll take from it what you want. <laughs> really. Absolutely. Beautifully spoken. Yeah. And music is always going to be there. If you have mm -hmm. been, ever been this uh, entrenched in a very positive way in in music, mm -hmm. you cannot remove it. Even no. if you go into, you know, becoming a construction contractor, a gardener, and yeah. it's going to be present there and it's going to change the way that you do things. And, and teaching as well, you know, yes. with, uh, there are so, I, I've, uh, I started out teaching English as a foreign language and then it was English as a second language and I taught Japanese and I taught Spanish. And I thought to myself, why am I not? I love teaching. I, mm -hmm. I love um, sharing my experiences with others. And you know, you, it's a t teaching is always a learning experience as well. Uh, I always grow immensely from my students. And I thought, why am I not doing this with music? I've been singing music longer than I've been speaking any of those languages, longer than I've been speaking English or understanding it, most certainly. And uh, that has been a beautiful journey yeah. that has definitely um, benefited from all of, of the, mentioned, the, the aforementioned uh, experiences. Yeah. And that still stays with me and I can use, I can teach music in so many capacities, you know, regardless of what's going on in the world, you can continue to, to teach music in some way. You can. And I think yeah. it's a beautiful opportunity right now too, because um, the online teaching experience and learning experience is it's different, but there's a lot of benefits to it. I agree. Um, the technology is getting better and better by the day. Mm -hmm. And then there's that kind of unspoken advantage where you're not limited to your local area anymore. So you, you really, the world is your oyster pretty much. Mm. If you want to go on and find um, just the perfect mentor teacher for yourself, somebody who specializes in exactly, you know, what you love to do. I mean, there's nothing like finding that perfect fit for you in a mentor. And, you know, I would, I definitely, you know, 
encourage people to, you know, just look beyond your local area and see what's out there because um, pretty much every music teacher is getting their act together right now. <laughs> in the yes. And, and those who were too busy touring and being in the limelight, you know, now are slowing down and offering music. Yeah, yeah there's some great opportunities right now. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've picked up the ukulele during the pandemic yeah. and I did my first Zoom lesson with one of my very favorite ukulele players up in LA. And uh, that was really, really satisfying. Yeah. And it, it makes you start thinking of all the other opportunities. Yeah. I know we, that's a great example where um, I think some people might be real surprised at who's teaching right now if they, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they reach out. How approachable everyone is. Yeah, absolutely. Ironically. <laughs> yeah. Um, what has your experience been like teaching online during this time? What technologies are you using and having success with? I started out with FaceTime and Zoom and I do all Zoom now. Mm -hmm. um, and since I started teaching in person in July, when we opened up a bit here in San Diego County, and when I say I teach in person, I, um, my studio, half of it is outdoors with French doors that open up. So we, any singing does happen outdoors with distance and uh, we're very careful, but, um, I still have half of my students online with zoom. And I'd say the first month working through connectivity issues was the most obvious latency. The delay from one person to the next was, is, and was the only issue that, uh, well, it's the biggest issue mm -hmm. uh, with working with um, very specific parts of music that require two people to play at the same time right. or sing at the same time. It's, it's not going to happen as uh, quite yet. Although there are many platforms that are really working hard to try to make that happen. Yeah, and Jam Kazam uh, just did a GoFundMe or an Indiegogo. I can't remember which of the two um, campaigns to raise funds to up the ante on their latency mm -hmm. focus. Mm -hmm. And I'm very hopeful for what they might be able to produce because I know that already chamber orchestras um, have had some uh, success with, with uh, rehearsing through Jam Kazam. At any rate, uh, we are still dealing with latency. Mm -hmm. Sound waves can only go so fast through, through digital and so then what I found happens is now my ear and the ear of the student has to improve. Our timing has mm -hmm. to improve to give that, um, that measure of lateness. Mm -hmm. So if they're, for example, if I'm doing vocalizing exercises with my students and we're working on a really specific area in their range, in their, in their, pitch and uh i and we're working on a rhythm pattern <laughs> i'll create i'll we'll go back and forth we'll echo the rhythm pattern and and i will so we, we're really getting a lot into hand percussion which surprisingly you would you would assume that a singer or someone who is studying voice would know how to clap and sing to a rhythm if they're an ad adult who has been singing, but it's actually not a skill that is always included when right. people sing choirs or when they sing solos or when they, they, they don't have that, that experience mm -hmm. of patting a body part or tapping a foot or bouncing the body to show tempo yeah. and so that has come out a lot more actually during um, the Zoom lessons because mm -hmm. it's absolutely essential that if I'm going to show where a melody falls inside of a tempo mm -hmm. and I'll sing it and I'll say in one, two, three, go. And then they'll go. 
but and then they get part of it wrong if they can't do this and sing off of the beat then we have to go to something much simpler so uh that has definitely been the biggest challenge and also the biggest eye opener because i think people are getting better at rhythm and then the other thing is um for students who at every human is able to sing i'm one of the people who believes that every yeah. human mm -hmm. there is no such thing as tone deafness that i i believe there's no such thing as tone deafness even with limited hearing and even with almost no hearing mm -hmm. um, i've had students with hearing aids who forget their hearing aids uh it's not part of it it's you know the vibration inside your head mm -hmm. you can copy a resonance in your body and you can pretty much find a pitch as long as someone is there to guide you to go up or down and then when and then when you get positive reinforcement they feel it and if they keep practicing that i have seen dramatic progress mm -hmm. when it comes to having pitch problems yeah. but the number two thing about online lessons for me has been dealing uh, trying to help address pitch accuracy mm -hmm. when I cannot be in the same room as them because uh, for some people if they really cannot if their brain cannot tell their muscles you know, they hear the note but the brain is not telling the muscles accurately where to go mm -hmm. or they hear the note but they can't really hear what they're singing when they try to sing it if I stop them and have them close their eyes and I stand right behind them and I sing over their shoulder going forward. And I say, close your eyes, imagine the note, imagine singing it. And we do it on a few notes. Everyone gets it. Everyone mm -hmm. gets it. And I can't do that now. Yeah. Not, not with distance, but we do find a way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, it sounds to me like you're a really great teacher for getting singers into their bodies. It sounds like that's a <laughs> big part of your practice, which I absolutely love. Um, I've had the opportunity to experiment a little bit with two um, platforms. One is SoundJack, um, which is definitely a lot like Jam Kazam. So the reducing the latency is like amazing. Oh, really? Um, yeah, on that one. Uh, that one requires a little more, a little more technical know-how. It's more... Um, the willingness to make adjustments on either either person's end um, with just, you know, settings here and there. Okay. The other platform is Clean Feed. And so I've tried I've, Clean Feed. Yeah, I've yeah. tried having the uh, session on a Zoom call, muting the Zoom audio, and then making the Clean Feed call and the, you know, the fidelity and the latency is reduced on that too. So the fidelity is fantastic. Yeah. I've had, you know, pretty good luck so far. I'm still like working out kinks with that. But um, I think the number one problem that I'm faced with is the willingness of singers to <laughs> work out the technology. And that, that's a bummer. It really is because um, it, it can get tough just you know, obviously the the number one thing a lot of us have learned about, um, you know, music and technology online is uh, going direct with, with an Ethernet cable. And that that is like the, you got to do that. You yes. got to do that if you want to have any success yes. with this at all. And um, I, a lot of times struggle to get that or, um, you know, just even having someone sign up for a Zoom account. So I'm always looking oh, for yeah. what are those you know what are those things that some teachers have come up with or you know have been able to inspire you know their clients and students to really embrace the technology and get into it because it's going to be a big part of their future in absolutely music. much <laughs> no. faster than they would have anticipated yeah. i had a i had a few students join uh during pandemic mm -hmm. uh, which i thought was very interesting like the first month of going all online I had an influx of new students and one, and of course there was always the, you know, getting on board with digital and, and creating the zoom. It helped if they were uh, children because mm -hmm. the parents were already having to do this for the kids yeah. for school. 
Um, and then eventually it helped with, I found more with the women, um, the adult women, because a lot of their other social gatherings were being brought to Zoom or something like Zoom. And so they were jumping on board and they were actually teaching me little bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I did have a couple students who were men who were, oh, well, let's wait until this all passes over. Yeah. And then I'll meet you in person. And then they waited a month and saw, okay, it's not going to pass quickly. Let's give it a try. And once they just had a little taste of it, yeah. it once they just opened the account and just were able to see each other like we're seeing each other now, they thought, okay, I, I can do this. Even if, if we, we come upon problems, you know, as long as the, uh, the vibe that's been sent out by the teacher or the facilitator is very uh, peaceful and, and patient and let's find the angles and troubleshooting yes. and um, not making them feel bad about not understanding then it i haven't had a problem at all with people moving keeping going forward yeah that's that's probably a huge part of it is just knowing that you are going to have to um do a lot of hand holding through it but that's okay you know that's okay yeah. if that gets them in the door that's probably the best thing but and i would hope they do the same for me yeah, definitely. Um, as far as technology goes too, have you done any live streaming? Other than a few Facebook lives and one test earlier this week, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done a full-fledged live streaming uh, concert. Mm -hmm. um, I did do that I had um, put together. I did one with Peter Sprague and his live from Sprague Land series a few weeks ago and uh so much fun uh he has a, a recording studio with individual rooms and cameras in every room and it took oh my gosh. four months of of him investing in new equipment and and um really connecting with people technologically savvy people that could help him get everything all everything connected properly and then get his internet um, righted. He even got um, spoke with George Varga of the Union Tribune, and they did a, a piece on what it took to make mm -hmm. this happen because he literally had to dig trenches and lay cable to come to his house. Wow, a couple blocks. <laughs> wow. And, uh, <laughs> so he was very invested in it and worthwhile, hundred percent. It was such a wonderful experience. And he's been a great source of, well, gosh, he's been a mentor that I can't even express for these last 12 years, but a great source of, um, of soundboarding and inspiration in these last four months as I've been trying all, you know, just clean feed and jam kazam and nin jam. And we, we tried very hard to find a platform where we could have three or four or five musicians playing from their own homes set up very nicely with no latency or at least the latency that we could handle. And I mean, we tried Yeah. and it was funny. <laughs> we found, you know, you could play bossa nova because as long as you didn't have the downbeat, you could <laughs> yeah. fake it, but, uh, or in lots of ballads and rubato, but yeah, nothing that swung, nothing that was like in the pocket. But um, I have been continuing to do my research and buy equipment when I'm finding things that, that I need to get in place. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start next, not this coming Sunday, not today's Friday. Yes, today's it is, Friday. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that happens in pandemic yeah. testing. <laughs> Which students did I have? Oh, yes. Um, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, August 23rd, I am going to start um, a live series um, called Garden Stream. Garden Stream Live, and I'm going to keep it small with just like a trio starting out. And my hope is to dial in one particular garden setting that has really strong internet and great acoustics and great lighting. Uh, uh, at the moment, we're going to, for the first two weeks, so August 23rd and 30th, we're going to do it in my courtyard um, at uh, a beautiful home in Del Mar, California. And uh, 
see how it goes there. I'll be with Joe Amato on guitar and Ivana Wasinski on bass. And I'm going to have it thematic from concert to concert, um, various themes that might be seasonal or, or uh, someone's birthday or a tribute or whatever the wind blows. Yeah. But um, I'll be posting details for that this weekend mm -hmm. and creating some Facebook event pages. But I'm going to, my hope is to restream on, or excuse me, to simul stream on YouTube Live and Facebook Live. Okay. Uh, uh, my focus will probably be on YouTube Live with the, the restream over onto Facebook Live for those who don't have a YouTube account or just prefer Facebook. But I'll probably be interacting more on the YouTube side. Um, I really do love the concept of YouTube a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And I have been following youtubers <laughs> uh, influencers of all kinds and musicians who are very very active on youtube and who got their start on youtube who are patreon uh, uh musicians and and have their the the crux of their careers on youtube and i'm fascinated by that and i'd like to get more going there um so starting next sunday the 23rd uh five o'clock uh, garden stream live and that will be super exciting and the the test that i did this earlier this week from mm -hmm. that location um i didn't have a lot of time to get the test all set up before i started teaching that day so i had all of my equipment out and um i started the the stream spoke about you know interviewing with you and sang a song on the ukulele and none of the audio was going. Oh, time. man. <laughs> it was silent. But, you know, I, I wasn't standing up and going and checking. You know, I was. <laughs> so, okay. That's one way that it won't work. So I do have an idea of what happened. And yeah. I'm going to give it a couple more goes this week before next Sunday. So yeah. we'll get it figured out. Yeah. Just like we did today. We did. Oh, man. If you, Thank you, Facebook. There could have been a fly on the wall with Allison and I last night trying to get out. Totally. Ooh, that was, it was a valiant effort, though. It really was. We, we, no stone was left unturned. No. We tried oh everything. Gosh. We did. We really yeah. did. I had, to, I had to walk that off for a couple miles after. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good oh. swim the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so worth it, though. I've loved talking with you. Um, oh, thank when, you. Likewise. Yeah. When can we expect um, the singles and the EPs to drop? So I need to reconnect with my producer yeah. and finalize the edits the final edits all of the songs are recorded and get all of the money issues taken care of and i see it i'm very very close and uh, i see it happening uh, i'm very very close to finalizing everything and then release happens three months later i'd mm -hmm. say so um where are we now it's yeah we're in the middle of august now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so definitely fall okay i can't wait any longer i'm very excited to get it out and to have something new to focus on and yeah just to uh to uh let it bloom you know yeah Been something sitting great to look to forward to exactly we need yeah. new goals right now yeah. Yeah. And just, I just want to tell you, and of course, anybody out there who's not familiar with your music, your voice is spectacular. I, I just, oh, it is um, magical to listen to. I absolutely thank love the work so that much. you do. I love the concept of the new album. And I just, I, I admire who you are and what you do in the music community. Um, you're just, your business savvy and um you just uh you're a, you're a great musician and human being in the in the community and i so appreciate you coming on with me tonight and your patience for last night <laughs> oh gosh no i was we were we were learning together and thank you so much for those beautiful words and i absolutely feel the same about you oh, thank and you. we don't have to say that that's that's coming from the heart oh thanks yes. so and much. we're new friends we are new yes. friends we've been around each other only a handful of times and and you are one cool chica so oh. thank you so much for everything you're nice. doing for the community with this and and what you're doing with your students 
And wow, yeah, what you do with the Mighty Untouchables and all of the other things you've got your fingers dipped in. Lots of pots. <laughs> Thank you so I much. I applaud you. Thanks. You too. And I will make sure that I have links up um, for all of your uh, socials and everything so everybody can catch your live streams. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, we just thank you to everybody who logged on tonight and watched. And thanks for sharing this with the community. Um, also, I want to encourage singers out there to go to um, don'tbethatsinger.com and pick up my new digital course. Um, it's really fun, nice. but it's also really, really informative. It has a lot of info on um, just ideas for moving forward, but also uh, keys and tips that are going to stand the test of time becoming successful in this business. So I definitely encourage everybody to do that. And also come and check us out again on Thursday, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday, I'm going to have uh, Clay Colton as my next guest. Oh, cool. Yeah. So once again, thank you so much. Wonderful to see you and talk to you again. And I hope that um, I'll be seeing you in person sometime soon. Likewise. All the best to you. You too. Take care. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night.